He is working as a senior medical physicist. He is working as a senior medical physicist at Aga Khan University Hospital, and he is IMPCB diploma and a certified medical dosimetrist. Thank you, Mr. Rahim Gohar, for uh, joining uh, this series, and we are looking forward to your valuable talk. So, if uh, the participants have any question during the meeting, please type your questions uh, during the meeting in the chat box. We will uh, entertain all question and answer at the end of the talk. Thank you. Over to you, Mr. Rahim Gohar. Uh, hi, hi everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Bushra, for your in kind introduction, and uh, also thanks to the the, <clears throat> the, the board members of uh, the multidisciplinary physics team for giving me this opportunity. And uh, and hopefully, I'm not going to bore everyone because uh, today we are not going to discuss the the complex mathematics we discussed earlier about the rate of biology. This will be a very simple. Um, um, discussion, and I'm going to share our personal ex my personal experience that uh, how we can go towards the board certification and why we need to do this board certification. And our focus will be only on the International Medical Physics Certification Board because there are various boards across the world, but uh, our focus today will be only on this part. So hopefully you can see my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. Yeah, good. Uh, no, it's not allowing me to. I cannot move my slides. Just give me one second. Uh, for some reason. Yeah, so the, the disclaimer is that the whole content of my presentation is both based on my personal experience. And uh, there are two parts of the presentation. The second part will be, of course, uh, related to the IMPCB, this history. And I have taken uh, consent from the Dr. Collins, the president of the International Medical Physics Certification Board. So let's, let's define uh, the certification trust before we go into the details. And I have taken these slides from the IAE website that how they are defining the, the certification. You can see uh, it refers to the process of assessment of an individual resident at the end of their clinical training program. So we will, we will go through what does it mean by clinical training program because I think most of the people back in the country are afraid of this word that someone has to go through the clinical training program before going to the certification. And also, we know that IAEA is not an accreditation body, that's for sure, it's a regulatory body, but it incorporates with the International Medical Physics Certification Board, which is good now. So from here, you can see, this is the, the slide I have taken from the website. The IAEA is accepting, and they are working very closely with the International Medical Physics Certification Board to set up an accreditation and a certification program where there is no program is existing. And this is applicable only to the member states. So I think everyone knows this document. If you need the detail about the certification, the, this is the, the joint publication by IEA and International Medical Physics Certification Board. And of course, there was involvement of International Medical Physics as well, IUMP. Um, when, you, when you read this document, I have taken this slide, and uh, I know most of you know, uh, but I have intentionally added this into my slides that, again, you can see, of course, you need the basic degree, first of all, in physics. So most of the people are getting confused with this kind of uh, postgraduate programs in medical physics. They're saying, we have a basic degree, but we don't have the postgraduate program in medical physics. So this is not going to stop you from doing the certification, that's, that's for sure. Because I will discuss later on, we have the alternatives. If you don't have any training program, if you don't have a post-graduation degree, you don't need it. 
Although this is a standard document, it's well and good. If you have an MS, if you have a PhD, if you have a proper residency program, that's fine. But still we can skip and if we can step away move from here, either it's like the, the on-job training program at Khan Hospital, or similarly, we have only you know, MS program for at the class. So it's not applicable for everyone. So we can skip that. And then you must be working for a certain period of time under the supervision of a clinical medical physicist. And then you can be uh, allowed to get the certification. We will discuss this, but this whole document of the IAEA is saying like this. So don't, don't focus too much on this part. Similarly, I have taken this definition that how we are going to define a qualified medical physicist from the APM website. They are saying that the one, the individual who is competent to independently provide clinical professional services in one of the subfields of medical physics. And we know the, sub, uh, the categories of the medical physics. So we can, uh, wait, wait, I'm, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, so now uh, certification, uh, why certification is the basic question today everyone is asking, especially in our part of the world, because there is no regulatory requirement, there is no um, job requirement. So let's, let's uh, I will try to explain through the historical, historical importance. And uh, of course, it's going to increase your credibility that leads towards the, the safe practice, that's for sure. And in some countries, it's the regulatory requirement even. And now I will show you some examples that is the mandatory hiring requirement as well now, especially, of course, US, uh, uh, Canada, Australia, UK, and even the now UAE, they have started to put this as a mandatory requirement. And the, the most important thing is in every department, medical physics is the resource person. If you are stuck anywhere, they will say, ask the medical physics. But now who is going to ask the medical physics, are you qualified or not is the question, right? So you are, the, you are, you are basically making the decisions, but whether your decision is, uh, is valuable, is there any credibility? So these are the questions. So it's all about to define the QMP. Qualified medical physicist. And now let me uh, let me give you a little bit of historical background. That, um, as I said, uh, and the historical background that accidents and incidents in unusual occurrences in radiotherapy they are occurring everywhere, everywhere. But if you look at the map, you might think that <clears throat> nothing is happening in the part of the Africa. Um, nothing is happening in the part of the Asia and in China, but the things are happening in the US, Canada, and, uh, and in Europe where there's a certification program. So this can be, may be a misleading for anyone, but the problem you know is the reporting. So we are not doing any kind of RCA. We are not doing any kind of incident reporting system. We are not making any learning point from it. So because there's not a part of our course, we are not trying to do that. So this is the basic lacking. Therefore, so this figure, this picture might be misleading, but that's the reason they have developed incident reporting system. Again, let's go to the history that uh, why, why we need a certification, why we need to define the qualification. So if you read this paper, it was published long time ago, but you can see the highlighted, don't ignore the rest of the, the uh, text. Professional mistakes. You can see 17%. These accidents in radiotherapy happened because of the professional mistakes. Now, who are the professionals in radiotherapy? Medical physicists, the RTTs, and of course, the radiation oncologists. But luckily, we have well established training and residency programs for the medical doctors. And therefore, physics, you know, we don't have even a proper training program. There is no any proper structures, the residency program. That how we are going to cope up. We will see later on there too how IOMP and the IAEA, they developed 
such a kind of programs for those countries where there is no any training program, there is no any residency program, so that we can reduce these kind of professional mistakes by checking their credibility, their potential to work independently as a medical physicist. So these were the number of errors, as I said, the total number of professional errors were 47, which is making up to 16% of the total errors. And you can see there, don't only look at the professional errors, you can see the training, of course, the supervision, of course, the communication errors, professional errors, all these errors, errors in procedures. If you don't understand how to read a report, task report published by the APM or IAEA, then you are going to make an error. For that, you need, of course, a training. You need to check your credibility, all those things. So this is, again, um, you must have seen this document published by the IAEA uh, series where the lesson learned from the accidental exposures in radiotherapy. It's a huge document, but I have just uh, added one slide which gives us a recommendation, their findings. These were their final findings. One of their final findings rather, that you can see suitability of qualified person. You know, all take all the reasonable measures to prevent failures and errors, including the selection of suitable, suitably qualified person. Now, who is going to define who is suitable? I mean, anyone who is doing the uh, PhD in medical physics cannot practice clinical medical physics, right? So you need to define, you need to rely on someone. And for that, you need to do any kind of an independent exam. So similarly, ICRP publication, if you go through the 86, and uh, they are saying the same thing. The deficient staff training. This was one of their findings. The lack of the uh, sufficient staff training. And uh, uh, if you don't go through a structured training uh, without any uh, independent exam, again, this will lead to the incidents. Uh, this is the, the publication uh, by the Journal of Medical Physics and that incident reporting and learning radiation oncology. Again, just I'm picking only important things that US Nuclear Regulatory Authority Regulatory Commission shows that 60% or more of those incidents were related to human error again. So it has nothing to do with the machine, it has nothing to do with the software, it's the human error, the lack of knowledge, lack of training, you know, lack of confidence. These were the issues. So from the, from the history I have shown you, now you can imagine that why there is a need, why there is a need of a certification, why there is a need of a training and accreditability. So the, this is the statement by International Organization of Medical Physics that they're saying the medical physics, this is to work in, in a medical institution with clinical responsibilities should be trained as a help professionals in a similar format as other health professionals. They're saying that they should be trained just like um, the other doctors. A second, how we can minimize? Trying to minimize this one. Uh, just give me a second. So, anyways, uh, I can't I can't see the the headings because the the, the bar is not going. That's the problem. So now I was saying that this is one of the mandatory requirements for some of the job descriptions. You can see the first one. Uh, of course, if you are uh, applying somewhere outside your country, this one is for the Australia, you need at least American, uh, Australian College of Physical Scientists and Engineers in Medicine, or you must be a diplomat of American Board of Radiology, or you must be International Medical Physics Certification Board, or you should have a healthcare professionals and the council. Uh, similarly, CCPM, Canadian College of Physicists in Medicine, these are the requirements, the basic requirements. Similarly, if you are applying to UK, you must have the registration with SCEC, Healthcare Professionals Council. 
Similarly, if you are applying for the US, US of course, you need ABR. Same is the case for the, uh, the, the Canada. Uh, you, you must have the CCPM or ABR. Uh, now the question again is how and who is going to define QMP is the question. Now you have certain international bodies, as I mentioned their names here. And uh, of course, we are not going to discuss one, none of them because their requirements are very tough. And uh, because based on our educational system, based on our training and our residency, we cannot do that. So the only way for now is we can, we can get certification through International Medical Physics Certification Board. And uh, I don't know now locally how we can do this, like the PNRA, I'm not sure in future maybe. And uh, some countries have their own state licenses and implement that as well. And uh, what could be the role of the Pakistan Organization of Medical Physicists in this case? And uh, because we know that again, the PNRA is not a, is a regulatory body, it's not an accreditation body. If there is no professional body in the country, then who is going to do the recommendations? Who is going to make the syllabus? Who is going to make the questions? Who is going to make the exam committee? So that they can put the recommendations to the PNRA. The best of that, even we can get the accreditation of our form, and then we can conduct our exams as well. That's another option. So um, now I'm going to give you a history. Uh, this presentation was, uh, this was presented by Dr. Collins in Doha when I was there for the exam. So I have taken his permission. Uh, after that, we will come back there. So screen. Um, actually, the history the story started in 2008 when the American College of Medical Physicists, during their annual meeting, they discussed that how we can develop the medical physics in Asia, China, and uh, those part of the country, uh, the areas where there is no medical physics. So this was their uh, program schedule. Then um, the same uh, American College of Medical Physicists in, in Virginia, they started again the same discussion that how we are going to develop in the mid Middle East, how they are going to put recommendations and the medical certifications for the Indian region. These were the discussions which were going on. And then uh, a task group was established by International Organization of Medical Physics so that they can work on this. And the International Organization of Medical Physics established a task group to investigate how we are going to format an international board in early 2009. And uh, of course, the goal was to improve the clinical medical respect, especially in the developing countries. This was there. Of course, this task group was, uh, 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 the members were consist from different countries and they try to include even from the US so that they can give the guidance and Asia, Middle East, Africa, Europe, and ultimately, after a long struggle, they managed to establish formally in 2010 International Medical Field Certification Board. Um, yeah, we are not going to the details. It's just the, who was the president and who was the secretary. Uh, established, of course, and then uh, there were 11 charter members and uh, you know all these organizations and uh, only one member was observing and uh, the model of certification was adopted and the bylaws were adopted and the initial board of directors were there and they properly established an office and initially the president was calling out things recently adil mustafa is a diagnostic medical physicist from the us currently if you see the website he's still the chief executive officer with the remand uh, these are the guys who are also conducting the exam as well, especially the oral exams. You will find all these guys when you when you go through. So these guys from the, uh, the Australia, the chief examiner. Yeah, and uh, uh, again the history. Let's not do so. So the important point here is that this board has importance because there is the involvement of board of directors and that there is a representation of international medical physics. Um, now there were initially only one member from IOMP, but recently they have revised their policies and there are three members from the, um, the IOMP. 
So the, the, the exam material, everything is under the supervision of the IOMB. So it, it, it gives the credibility to the International Medical Field Certification Board and of course the IAEA as well. Um, again, uh, um, memorandum of understanding was signed uh, in May 2015 uh, in Toronto and uh, the edit additional representation, there was an additional representation of IUMP, as I said earlier. And uh, the minimum standards in the, uh, the, the, the purpose, the purpose was that to establish at least the, the minimum standards to improve and the practice medical physics, to develop standards and the procedures for the certification of the medical physicist, to establish the infrastructure and the requirement and the assessment procedures for the accreditation of medical field certification board. So here I need to mention one more thing that they are doing the individual certification plus even they can accredit uh, regional organizations as well. Just like they can, we can formally put application for the accreditation of the form. That's what they are doing as well. Other than the, the thing they have, they are doing the individual certification. Uh, of course, this is the major uh, task by the IMPCB that how they are going to evaluate the qualification of a candidate who is applying for the exam. Because the qualifications you mentioned in the document are not really applicable for uh, the third world countries where there is no proper medical education. So they really need to evaluate based on your experience and your hands-on training and of course the basic degree in physics. And uh, then they will, they have a, a they have a committee and for, uh, for the examination. Uh, in, the, in the document, they will, you will see that advanced degree or equivalent level of uh, master's level majoring in medical physics or an appropriate science subject. So this is what they are asking for. The problem here sometimes that most of the people are misleading because they are thinking that we need a MS degree for that. You don't really need an MS degree. You must have minimum of 16 education. And uh, if you have 136 credit hours, um, then even there's enough. And they will review your transcripts. They will review your uh, syllabus. And if you have covered the advanced level physics, the nuclear physics, the quantum physics, the classical, and uh, all those subjects, then you are OK to go. So they will review, they will evaluate individually they will not just look at your degree and the highest degree and this and that, and they will say yes or no. They really evaluate. Uh, professional training, again, as I said, um, I think uh, the structured training program in Pakistan is only happening at uh, Khan Hospital, as far as my knowledge is concerned. If, uh, the rest, we don't have any training program, except we have an MS degree in medical physics from the PS. So, but it covers if you are um, an own job without a structured training program and you have worked for two years, three years, four years, then that covers that your training part because of course you must be working under the supervision of a qualified medical physicist. And the part of the application of course is that you have to, somebody has to write a letter for you that, the person has worked in the hospital under the clinical environment for many, many years, and he has done this, 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 and that. So that covers the training part. So don't focus too much on the training if you don't have a structured training program. Again, of course, as I said, make it a part of the proper document. They are saying two years full-time equivalent, um, but still there's fine. Your work for two to three years will cover this part. Uh, now, if you, if you see the part one, um, the part one is just, uh, the, you, they will, uh, there are hundred uh, and multiple choice questions and um, it covers mostly a general physics. And if you study the proper FM Khan and the book of IAEA, it's more than enough to cover your part one. From my experience, that's what I, I should say. Of course, for part three, we will, we will discuss a bit in detail. Uh, you must be working as a medical physicist, that's for sure. 
because uh, without uh, the clinical experience uh, part two is a bit difficult and of course part, part three is just to check that are you reliable to work independently as a clinical medical physician test there are you safe the purpose of the part three is just to determine the candidates is safe to practice medical physics independently that's it so it has a five parts they will cover the quality assurance and radiation safety of course uh, the radiobiology and uh, i forgot uh, there are basically five sections and each examiner will check your uh, each part in the part three when you can fail in one section if you are not good at quality assurance you can fail and you can reappear for that if you're not good at the planning if you're not good at the um, radiobiology that you can prepare for that so once you are done with part one the part two uh, for part three, it's not that uh, uh, it's not that difficult if you're really practicing physicist here. Yeah. Part one is difficult because most of us we have done our uh, we have finished our university a long time ago. Sometimes it's very difficult to remember the um, you know under uh, those old textbook physics. So therefore, you need to really struggle for part one. And you all of you know that the subspecialties. Uh, currently, they are only offering for this, and I think they were thinking for the nuclear medicine as well. Uh, as I said, this is the, the course outline uh, as a very basic physics and the small mathematics. The, the portion of the mathematics from my experience was very, very little. Uh, there was no as such calculus or other pure mathematics there. It was just a physics. Um, of course, you need a little bit background of the biomedical. And uh, the lastly, as I said, the image processing and the biomedical signal and image processing, a little bit. And the rest of the things are pretty much standard for everyone. But, but, but two, of course, as I said, you need a clinical experience that you should know about the acceptance testing and the commissioning. It does not mean you must have done acceptance testing, commissioning, and a configuration of any machine. It does not say like that. But at least if you have been asked that if you are doing a commissioning, then what are the protocols? What are the reports you are going to follow? What are the tests you are going to perform? If you are doing a validity test for any treatment planning algorithm, you need to follow a document, right? You cannot do your own things there. So they, they, they are expecting you, you should know the reports of the WAPM and the IAEA. That's what they are doing. And uh, similarly, I think you are familiar, all of you know that the radiobiology part, of course, uh, mostly, you know, the treatment gaps, uh, how you are going to calculate the BED, how you are going to calculate the EKD to the BED. So a few, few things. And the proton therapy, really, they will not, they're not going into the details of it because they know none of us are doing proton therapy there. But at least you should know about the Bragg peak and the certain advantages and disadvantages of using the proton beams. Um, the same is for the diagnostics, the same in the same pattern. And uh, of course, uh, they have not started yet uh, about the continuous medical profession that maintain your certificate, of course, you need to do a CMEs. Uh, they, are, they, are, they are planning on that uh, because once you get the certification, we need to maintain the certification as well. So I have mentioned this already. We have uh, subcommittees looking for the exam, part one, part two, part three. So as I said, currently the Thomas Thomas Crown from Australia, he's, uh, he's the chair. And uh, so far, they have accredited the Korean Medical Physics Certification Board, it means they can, they can certify their own Koreans, they can conduct the exams. Similarly, the Hong Kong, uh, in Hong Kong, there are two basically. Uh, and uh, you know, the individual exams were started back in 2017. And 
mostly in Priyasti and Dhaka in many, many cities in Doha. And so far, 200 candidates have started into the exam process, written and oral. And out of 200, we have 43 have completed all the parts. And uh, uh, we can say proudly that uh, from Pakistan, uh, Usman Bayou was the first one. And uh, we have a couple of more now. So I think four to five phases have been certified from the Pakistan. And uh, uh, I think some of them are still, still in, in the pipeline. So this is the summary. Uh, yeah, so let me let me go back to my my own presentation. So uh, because the question mark was why International Medical Physics Certification Board. So the first thing is is the accredited by IOMB. It's not something like that the five people came and they make an organization, created a website and they examine the people given the certification, no. It's accredited. The course outline, the examination, as I said, there are three representation, three representatives from the IOMB. So, and the second important thing is, is simple and easy acceptance criteria, which is very, very important for all of us because we are not, we are not fully qualified physicists, right? We don't have that, uh, that uh, luxury, except our, uh, our fellows from the PIAS, and hopefully the, 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 the PIAS, PIAS candidates will, will look at look to this. Um, so I, I try to summarize here the, the, the requirements to appear, because if you look at their documents, it's, it's misleading, as I mentioned earlier, that you must have a degree in physics. That's for sure. You cannot do this without physics degree. Secondly, structured training, or this is applicable to the, the AKU graduates who are doing the training. Second is on-job training. Now, I think many hospitals, they have started on-job training. If it's not structured, still it's on-job. And the third option, they can exempt you from all these is you must have extensive experience in the field. If, if, I mean, if you are working for 10 years in an institution with a multidisciplinary team and um, with all the equipments, latest equipments, there is no way they can reject you. So you can appear for the exam as well. Now, just the application process. Um, that they are always recommending to start informally. I'm going to show you the formal one, the informal one. This is my completely my own experience. Uh, so just, just to give you my example, that initially you have to write an email to the president and uh, of course the chief examiner saying that I want to appear for the exam. Just like I, I was appearing in, in February in 2019, Riyadh, and uh, I have done this, 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 I just said, and I sent some of my documents with as an attachment. And then uh, I got a reply saying that I was just randomly sending the documents uh, because I was not aware how to, how to send the documents. But there is a way I have been, uh, I, I was told that the format should be like this. If you, have, if you have a cover letter, it should be written 01-cover letter. And secondly, 02-application form. Similarly, agreement this, CV, this, 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 this. So um, once you are, uh, once you get the green signal informally from the president and the chief examiner, then you can make your application in a proper way. And um, when you, if you don't have, just like in at AKU, we 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 have, we did our proficiencies basically during the two years. But if you don't have the proficiencies, you need to make sure you can make an. Uh, a kind of your own proficiencies because you are doing a planning, you are doing a quality assurance, you are doing a research or whatever. I just that I am working from since 2009, 10, and since during this all liberations, I have done all this just to show them that you know. Uh, because sometimes, if you don't know, if you are not practicing physicists, especially part two and the part three will be difficult. Therefore, they don't want they, they want you they, they, they want to make sure that this guy is capable enough to appear for part two and part three as well. Therefore, they need the proficiencies as well. 
Uh, then once you send the application formally, you will receive an email with the candidate number. You will assign a candidate number. Uh, you can apply for part one and a part two at the same time. It's up to you if you are fully prepared. That's best because you can save the money uh, because you need to travel, right? Therefore, it's best to do part one and part two if you're prepared. Then they will say that we have reviewed your application and we are happy to this and that, you know, the formal emails that you are a successful candidate and you are accepted for part one and part two. And you will receive uh, the acceptance letter like this in a proper um, format with the logo of the IMPCB and uh, the details and the ways exam is going to happen and where, who is your examiner. Uh, So uh, uh, this was for, uh, uh, yeah, once you are done with the exam, within two or three weeks, you will get, a, uh, you will get a, an email again in a proper format. Uh, it's a pleasure to inform you that you have passed. Uh, so this is very um, difficult moment for those two weeks to wait, because if you say fail, then you are in trouble. So you have to apply again. So uh, this was just a good in Riyadh. This is me, and uh, you may see the relative here, and the rest of the guys, I don't know. Um, recently, uh, back in 2020, uh, Thomas Crown, uh, the chair of the, the exam committee, and the rest of the, the members, they have published the whole document. There's a publication about the IMPCB. And whatever I, am, I was saying during the, my previous presentation, you can find a summary that how many people have applied, how many failed, what you can do. You can follow this document. Uh, yeah, I'm almost done. Um, you can make uh, now an interactive session if anybody has any question. Thank you, Mr. Rahim Gohar. Uh, we got a lot done today, and thank you for your time. It was an informative session. So, if anybody has some questions, uh, you can ask. Okay, let's start with Mr. Muhammad Yasin. He just want to know why MP working in Pakistan are. Um, not much concern about the certification, uh, despite knowing its uh, importance. Could there be financial is issues or uh, there are some other issues also? Uh, I do agree with, um, uh, what was the name? I do agree with the gentleman. That the financial constraints are always there because the problem uh, is that you need to travel somewhere. Because these exams, they are happening in, in, in Italy most of the time because they have a collaboration with the ICTP, that medical physics program at ICTP, you, you know, all of you know that. It's not basically camp accredited, that program, but they have a very good collaboration with the uh, ICTP and the IUMP. Similarly, the, the Middle East and uh, um, in some uh, in Mexican countries, so you need to travel. So we are trying our best for last two years, and I think Sir Abdul Qadir was also working on it. That if we can convince at least twenty candidates, fifteen to twenty candidates, eligible candidates, this can happen in Pakistan. I mean, you can save a lot of money. So that's the biggest worry. Uh, I agree with uh, Yasin. Uh, that's the biggest worry. True, but. I think um, it's, it's very easy for the graduates of the PIAS and uh, especially and those who have done the training from Al Khan. I don't think except the financial constraints, there is another issue they can apply. And especially those who are working with their institution, they can apply through their institution. I mean, I did my certification. I did my part one and a part two with my own money because I was not thinking that the hospital will help me. Later on, I realized when I talked to my head of department and I said, uh, I have done this, the part one, the part two with my own money and I spent so much money. 
So he said, why not you are applying through the hospital? Because it's, 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 you, are willing, you are adding value to the hospital, right? You have a board certified physicist. So when I approached to that channel, nobody said nothing. They were happy, they accepted. So we should try uh, to approach through the hospital so that they can bear the expenses as well. Okay, thank you. There is a question for Mr. Uh, Amir Ali. Why we lag behind in organizing this exam in Pakistan? Despite knowing its importance, what is the collective uh, role of uh, all the medical physics community? Uh, Amir, thank you for the question. Uh, I think you know better than me. Uh, part of the reason that people are not serious is that, as I said, there is no any regulatory requirement. I mean, there is no any um, recruitment there is no requirement in the recruitment. Uh, just to give you an example, we were trying to interview some of the candidates for the, uh, the physics position here. And, uh, and even here in Africa, uh, the, the HR asked me to put that, that requirement of certification. Now, can you imagine that now in Africa is happening, uh, similarly in Middle East is happening, and I showed you the example. Now it should happen in Pakistan as well. and. Uh, Things are going wrong in some of the institutions, but we don't know. We don't know. We don't. We are not reporting that. So uh, the issue is again the non-seriousness. Uh, I don't know exactly the reason. You know, we cannot force someone to take the exam because it's the individual's choice. Regarding their qualification, I don't think so. There is an issue with anyone. I know, as far as I know, their small community. Everyone is qualified. Everyone can do that. You have the resources. We have been circulating those resources. We have been telling the individuals that we can help when making the application. And you know, Amir, how we, uh, we discussed this a long time ago, that how we can proceed. And you managed to do that even, right? So there is no, yeah, there's very, this, that's very simple. But I cannot comment on my finances, but someone will, might ask, you can finance so that I can do that. I cannot do that. Thank you. Thank you. I got your point. Yeah. There is another question from Mr. Aleem uh, that is certificate uh, renewed early or it is evergreen after passing the exam. Uh, Aleem, um, for now, as I said, uh, certification is valid. I mean, there is no expiry date for now. But as far as or discussions uh, through the group email we have discussed that they will start, of course, the continuous medical professional, uh, that, that CME kind of thing, that you need to um, do CMEs, certain CMEs 10, 15, or 20 yearly to maintain the certificate. But for now, they have not, they have not started yet. They have, there was no even the database you know, they were in the initial phase. Now they have a database. Even if you want to find out who is certified, you can go to their website, you can check the database. Similarly, the CPD, there is an option for the CPD, but they have not started yet. Uh, so which is, which is in their laws, in bylaws, if you look, if you read their bylaws, to maintain your certificate, you must be up to date. You must show that you have done the trainings, you have you have doing the, the, the lectures, attending webinars, all those things. And it will be effective soon, I guess. Again, there is, there is a question from uh, Mr. Zaim Ahmed. He's saying that, is there any challenge you have faced or facing right now after having the certification? Ah, uh, and no, no, after, after doing the certification, no, you, you are not facing any challenges. I mean, you are happy man, I guess, once you are done, you, even the institution can raise your salary. But of course, before applying for the exam, uh, you need to go through a certain syllabus, that's for sure. Because without preparation, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's impossible or it's difficult, but without preparation, it's a bit difficult. You need to prepare, that's for sure. You cannot, you cannot say that, let me put the application and go on the, and give the exam. It's not like that, but uh, definitely you have to 
you have to struggle a bit. And uh, if you, as I said, if you follow their uh, the, the guidelines and the, the syllabus and uh, the main syllabus textbook worldwide medical physicists are using, as I said, the FM Khan and the IAEA, there are so many books, but if you even go through all these books, you are well prepared to appear in the exam, appear in the exam. Okay, so there is another question from Mr. Aleem. He's asking, uh, do you have any idea about when will be the next exam uh, will be held over here or in any other country? Um, uh, Aleem, uh, if you just go to the website and they click on the exams, you will find out. I think the latest one was in Bangladesh, Dhaka, I guess. Uh, the next one, we don't know. But within the Pakistan, as we have discussed earlier, that uh, is the only pomp Pakistan Organization of Medical Physics, they can arrange this. They can arrange a small workshop and then they can uh, do this. I mean, it's not, you just need the numbers. They need the numbers, that's for it. That's for sure. Mr. Fezan Ahmad is asking a question that uh, what ch uh, changes in your clinical practice appeared after uh, this certification? Uh, Fezan, not really changes. Um, uh, how should I put it now? Uh, not changes. I, I mean, I said changes. But your thinking perspective is changing a little bit in a different way because when you are going through the exam, um, you, you are going through a part of the syllabus, a part of uh, the text content, which you are not practicing on daily basis, like, therefore you are thinking maybe changing in a, in a, in a different way. Just like to prepare for the, the oral exam, you need to follow a certain question answers that how to answer a clinical question in a such a way that you should look that you are practicing safely. Yeah. And just to give you an example, even this is my the, the one of the, my favorite question, even I mean, it's a very simple question uh, that if somebody is in RTT is calling you, this is a very common question you will be asked that the beam output is, you know, greater than 2%, 3% on the LINAC and RTT is calling you that, sir, the, the beam is out and is out of tolerance, should I continue the treatment? So what will be your reaction? Yeah, so they will ask like, uh, so you need to answer in a such a way that you should be safe. You cannot say yes, continue, right? So when you come uh, and uh, what, what are you going to do? What will be the first step? What will be the second step? How you are going to communicate with the supervisor of your RTTs? How you are going to communicate with your head of physics? Yeah, this kind of information, right? There should be no lack of information because nobody knows that the neck is down and you are scheduling the patients. So there should be your approach. So of course that approach, I change a little bit because I, I read the answers. Now I thought we are doing things maybe randomly, not in a proper manner, but if you, if you do it properly, that's the same practice and that's what they want to listen from you. So that changes my mind a bit. It opened my mind rather, not any change as such. Okay, thank you, Mr. Rahim Gohar uh, for your valuable information. And I would like to thank all participants uh, for joining this webinar. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bushra. Thank is you, there, Rahim, for such information. For me to talk. Uh, thanks, thank you, Amit. There is one more question. I guess we we'll ask him something. What do you think after getting the certification? You are feeling more comfortable than before your clinical practice, or you responsible after getting? Uh, you see, Hamid, um, not uh, not really. I mean. Um, the clinical practice is, is, is as I said, is the, is the standard you have to follow, right? You have to follow the procedures. But if you, you know, if, if you know the answer of why, 
why you are doing like this, why you are proceeding like this. That kind of comprehensive understanding makes a difference, that's for sure. If your system, just to give you an example, if your system is, you are doing an APPA uh, for a certain separation, is, is 10 separation, you are doing an APPA and you are giving a 200 centigrade and you are prescribing at the isocenter in the middle. And the system is giving you 150 mules from AP and 150 mules from the PA. Yeah. Uh, if you don't know the background, you are going to accept that plan, right? So that kind of thinking, of course, you, you should know what you are doing. So that kind of thinking, for that, you need to read. And that reading habits and uh, those uh, critical questions and the troubleshooting questions will open your mind. Otherwise, uh, definitely you are responsible. You should not be overwhelmed with so much appreciation that you have done this certification and ignore the, the clinical part. You can't do that. Your focus should be the patient centered. And uh, because again, you are the responsible person in the department to make sure that things are going in the right way. So certification should not change any of your clinical practice. It gives you a little bit confidence that you have done something and you have been evaluated by the top medical physicist in the world, right? Those guys who are examining you are the previous board members of different organizations and the, the current board members of the IOMP and the IMPCB. So they have a lot of clinical experience and then they will give you the certification after they feel that you are good to go, you are safe to practice medical physics. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Aleem is asking for your email. Yeah, I will. Uh, I will share my. I will share my. Asad is asking me to share my presentation. Um, uh, the one I have made, I can share. Uh, the one uh, presented by the Dr. Collins, uh, you can. Yeah, you can use it just for the academic purposes. Or if you can uh, present somewhere, then you need to ask him, please. So I will share the presentation. No worries. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, for this presentation and thank you all participants and speaker and MPTP organizer. Thank you so much. All right. Okay, bye everyone.